the property that we uh, are on today to uh, document or establish the history of Murphy is a TVA property. Now, I want to give a little bit of a disclaimer for this is because uh, uh, we know that the Indian site and Indian village was on this property, but because of the new federal regulations that was passed, you know, in the 70s, uh, you cannot come down here and hunt for artifacts because it's against the law. Okay, we're documenting the, the history of Murphy. Uh, and uh, to do so, we have come on site to the place where it started, on the banks of the Valley River. And later on, you'll see where Hiawassee and Valley River comes together. Because most of Murphy history in the early beginning centered around the confines of these two rivers. Now, the reason we started here is because of the uh, Indian village that was established in present. Reading Mooney's book where he collected the myths and legends and the information from the medicine man Swimmer, uh, Swimmer told him that around 1100 AD, the Cherokees, or what was then known, not the Cherokees, but as the principal people, moved into this area of Southern Appalachian Mountains. Now, uh, we don't know exactly what time they moved into this site, but it was sometime after 1100 A.D. Now, below us here is, is the village site. You can see how level it is and prevalent it is. Uh, it runs all the way to the confines of the river. The first white merchant that was established here, it was on the banks of the west banks of the Hiawassee, was Archibald Hunter and he was the first white merchant in this area. And we do know from his records that he traded with a substantial number of Cherokee families. He, he bought pelts and uh, skins and stuff from them. And uh, in his log uh, of the trading post, we have where he bought or sold to them uh, certain items. And uh, the archeologists have documented use that for documentation of, of certain village members and also his houses down the way on down towards Hanging Dog and Great Creek because they was able to find in excavation a piece of the pottery or a piece of the china that they that Archibald uh, Hunter had sold them from the store's ledger. Now uh, the village site that was here uh, whatever time it started after 1100 AD was uh, you have to use your imagination just a little bit because the river was, Valley River, was not as big as it is now because it was uh, backed up, the lake has backed up in it and stuff and widened it. Hiawassee River was not as big then, but Hiawassee was the bigger of the two rivers and stuff. And uh, the Cherokees oftentimes referred to this as uh, a word that is taken from Kanahida. We take Kanahida from it, which is a village site, but it's, it's a, we corrupted it because it's a, a Cherokee word that means long river or long valley. Now, this valley, this village site here, over to my right, and, uh, there, there is a small Indian mound. It was just a small mound that was the temple mound where they had their, their council house. And uh, the village site throughout was houses of wad and dauble because the Cherokees did not use log cabins or teepees or, or the like. They, used, they built wad and dauble, which is saplings just laced together, put thatch on them, and then mudded them. And that's the kinds of houses they lived in until the colonials or the, started coming in in the late 1700s and early 1800s. We'll call it the colonists, which the primary ones were Scotch-Irish, then German, then uh, Welch, and then English, then the Scots. 
uh, they would clear the mountains for their pastures and their uh, farms. And so they used the timber that they cut to build their log houses, to build their barns and their fences and their furniture. And the Cherokees, being adaptable as they are, said that's a good idea. So the Cherokees started building log houses. And you will find Cherokee log houses that was modeled after the Scotch-Irish. We know that recognize them because they're dovetailed. And then some of them would, would mock the Germans. The Germans modified the dovetail and just had one slat on it and the bottom was flat. And then the English, when they built log cabins, they did the saddleback, which is just cut out a groove and set the log down on it. So that's the way you trace you know, some of the, uh, the, the houses of the Cherokees that followed Bill. Now, uh, I mentioned one time there, but the Cherokees was not known as Cherokees in the 1100. The Cherokees referred to themselves as principal people. And uh, then when Europeans came in and began to contact them, they, they took the corruption of a, one of their chiefs' name and began to call them Cherokee. So the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Choctaws, the Natchez, uh, all Seminoles, those are historical Indians that was given name because of the European contact. Now, uh, this village site was located long enough here on this flat area to uh, become very sophisticated because in starting out as uh, Mississippian or woodland Indians, they, they were, you know, sort of small group and stuff. But this village site was so large that they could specialize in, in, in their labor. And so there's one site down here next to the river where uh, I was able to locate a, a part where the uh, flint napping took place because just gobs of shards and uh, broken arrowheads and spear points and stuff was located in that area. So it was a specialized field. Other areas would be that they had grown to specialize in would be the basketry or their uh, pottery and stuff. So, uh, so like I said, the, this village site would have went up to the time of the removal. In this area that we've, we, or we are in now, the, uh, as you've noticed from the shots that you've been able to see, is this is a very level, flat village site. And this is the only elevation part of it. This is, this is on the back, towards the back side, about midways. And this would be the Indian mound. This would be where they had their council house. And, uh, you know, because they always reverend and respected the, the council house, which would be a, a seven-sided structure with the different clans represented in it. And uh, most likely uh, in this council house that was here on the Indian Mound would be where the effigy that we have at the museum representing the Moon-Eyed people was kept to show the uh, descendants uh, of the people that the Cherokees displaced when they moved in this area. But uh, it wasn't a big mound, but just big enough to elevate and respect the council house. Okay, down here in the flat area, as you can see, I mentioned up there this, that the, this village had grown to the level of specialization. And uh, I remember coming down here in high school and stuff and finding the flint napping area in, or over here next to the creek. And uh, it was very prevalent that that, that was the, the manufacturing site of their, their arrows, points, and their spearheads and, and knives and stuff because uh, it, there so, were so many different kind of uh, rocks, uh, the flints, the quartz, you know, and even some obsidian that was a trade item from out west, you know, because they used some of that. Now, while we're here, and before we get too far into the, the thing, uh, this village site went all the way up and uh, 
even cross the river up to the Conahita Park. And the, what we're talking about with the Conahita Park was most likely the, the, the area where they grew their common crops, which was they referred to as the three sisters, beans, corn, and squash. And uh, that would be for the whole village. Now each village house, the Wad and Dobble house, would be a, have a little garden spot of their own. But the common field that would, would sustain and perpetuate the village was the area for probably where we play ball now. Okay, one of the things too that you've got to keep in mind when you're uh, viewing uh, historical context is that the topography has changed greatly. Uh, the flat part here was pretty consistent. The river, of course, as we mentioned earlier, was wider than it was before. And uh, if you'll notice on this far bank over here, that would have been level like this or down about this uh, height and over here because during the uh, building of TVA Dam, the TVA had to come in and build that up and uh, out of the floodplain and stuff. And so that changed the topography of this area greatly from that perspective. Okay, now there's a couple of things that you need to know about this spot. Is the, the main thing is the universally accepted myth and legend of the Cherokees that is accepted among the Cherokees and, and other tribes also is the Big Red Leech Hole. Now, if you notice where the rock water is breaking here, below that is the Big Red Leech Hole. And uh, to uh, prove his bravery to go to war or to take a maiden for a wife, a young Cherokee would have to walk this rock bridge. And if a big red leech didn't bubble up and, and pull it under, he was good to go. Now, the legend tells about the, that the Cherokees, and this would have been much more prevalent, this rock overhanging ledge here. Uh, in that day for TVA again did the construction. But the, the village people would sit on this rock ledge to watch the spectacle of him trying his bravery. Now, uh, again, keep in mind that the topography has changed considerably because the TVA filling this in. But uh, when I was a young boy, I would talk to uh, older men that was in town that was, grew up here and they would talk about playing down here. And they was underground caverns and, and small caves and stuff. And there was one underground cavern in particular that went from the Big Red Leech Hole here out to Notley River. And uh, they, uh, the ones I talked to said, yeah, oh yeah, they knew about it. And said they would mark a log or a chunk of wood uh, so they could recognize it and throw it in the Big Red Leech Hole and said in a, a couple of days, uh, two or three days, it would end up in Notley River. Now, so that is a very, uh, this is a very universally accepted place uh, among the Cherokees. Okay, if you'll notice across the way here, the, the ground is flat and it goes up to a small tapered hill. And then the creek that goes up this way and then up at the on the hill there, there are several real good spring heads where they provide fresh water. Now, according to the uh, effigy that we have in the museum that I mentioned a while ago that the Cherokees displaced the people and, and kept the, pecked out an effigy and put in the townhouse to let the descendants know who they displaced, we were pretty sure that the uh, people lived in this area here because they said in their myths and legends that they were afraid to cross the creek which would have been Valley River would have been smaller than the Hiawassee and so they were afraid to cross the creek because of the big red leech. Now the question is uh, since the Cherokees in their myths and legends talk about displacing the people and these people that they displaced were short, white, flat-faced, and blue-eyed. 
and had beards and long hair. So the Cherokees uh, referred to them. They were so blue-eyed that they couldn't come out of a day in the sunshine and do their work. So they would come out of a night. And so the Cherokees referred to them as the moon-eyed people. Now, at this juncture of time, we, we question the fact, where did the Moon-Eye people come from? Okay, prior to Columbus sailing the ocean blue in his adventures, uh, they were 12 ships left Wales, England to, uh, find the, to explore and find the New World. They never did hear from them. And so they think that they possibly made it and colonized because uh, Thomas Jefferson, in 1803, when he became president, he set the Indian policy for our nation by saying that eventually we would move all Native Americans off of the eastern seaboard and west of the Mississippi. And so he referred to these people as Welsh Indians. Now, Lewis and Clark, when they were exploring the Louisiana Territory for Thomas Jefferson, they noted in their journals that they had encountered the Welsh Indians at the Mississippi River. Now, uh, a University of Pennsylvania professor got interested in this legend, and so he set about to investigate it. And uh, he went all the way up into the Indiana, and from the tip of Indiana, down through the southern Appalachian Mountains here, he found stone construction of walls that was Welsh architect, like they are in Wales, England. And uh, there's a big one in, in North Georgia now, uh, still to this day. And they would build mounds around their, uh, their village and stuff, I mean, rock walls around their village and stuff. But, but it, it was a particular Welsh architect. And so uh, it's pretty certain that the Welsh Indians lived in that area and then eventually the Cherokees displaced them. They lived around them and with them a while but eventually displaced them. One thing that you'll find in uh, Cherokee territory as well as other Indian cultures and stuff throughout the woods and stuff you'll run upon what we refer to as a knee tree. And a knee tree is something where they have at one time or another took a sapling and pulled it over and tied it with a vine and bent it down. And the tr knee trees point to something prevalent. It can point to a watering hole or to a, uh, or a hunting ground. And in this incident, this one here, it's a good example of where a knee tree would point to something that was very prevalent in the Cherokee culture. The, the rock bridge of the Big Red Leech Hole. And there are, it could be referring to or pointing to the, across the territory there where the uh, Moon Eyed people lived. You know, so, you know, you'll find those throughout the woods, you know, that, that are left when you're out hiking or something. And, and that's usually what they mean. They pulled them down, tied them, pointing to something prevalent. Okay, the only road that was in and out of this area uh, prior to the removal and during the removal was called the Unicoi Turnpike. Part of it we know now is the Joe Brown Road. And uh, if you look in the distance over here where that, that green grass is, you can see the flat part. That's the, that, that's the old roadbed. And uh, the part that came into Murphy came down the Hiawassee River and connected down here. Now, Archibald Hunter who was, we mentioned, was the first white merchant in this area, had his trading post over here on the west banks of the Hiawassee. And he also established a ferry to, to go right in this area here, across to the Unicoi Turnpike. And I don't know where he later expanded it or, or had it set up then, but he also crossed the Valley River, the confines there, into the, the west bank there. Okay, now we have mentioned Archibald Hunter as the first white merchant in this area several times. 
And so just to document a little bit of where Archibald Hunter came from and who he is. He was a Scotsman. He came over and settled in the Virginia area. And then from Richmond, Virginia, he migrated down into North Georgia and then came back up to this way and established the, uh, his trading post. He traded with the Indians. And then later on, when the army moved in to uh, remove the Indians, he traded with the uh, army. And uh, we have a store ledger and some of the accounts that he had. He kept up with what he traded and sold. And uh, so he had, in his family, he had two daughters and at least two sons. And uh, we know that because after the Indians were removed down the Unicoi Turnpike and stuff, his sons took the store ledger and went to Fort Chase uh, on the on the trail on the route of the Trail of Tears to uh, collect the money that the military owed him. Now his daughters, uh, one of them, Martha, married one of the uh, Major Hitchcock, who was a doctor in this area, and uh, and so they they lived in this area after the removal and stayed a while and purchased land and and built a, a, a very substantial estate. But up in the 1840s, 40, mid 45, and on up to 40, the 50, uh, they wanted to go out to the southwest and with the military and fight the Mexican War, and so they migrated to the southwest, and then they eventually ended up in San Francisco, and they had a daughter, Martha and uh, Major Hitchcock. They had a daughter, and her name was Lillian and she grew up in San Francisco and married a very wealthy uh, person in San Francisco, the name of Coit, C-O-I-T. And because there's a Coit Tower in the park out there. Lillian Coit, because she was wealthy, she didn't have to work or, or, or had plenty of money, so she liked to travel. And she traveled all, done global travel. And when she went to Egypt and saw the pyramid, she was absolutely fascinated by it. And so when she came back to this country, she gave $10,000 to have a pyramid built over her grave, uh, her grandparents' and aunt's grave. And uh, the pyramid is down here uh, just off of Hunter Street. And, uh, and so they built the pyramid, and the Hunters had, had died and was buried down next to the, what is now the road that we came in here on and stuff. And so they was, their body was exhumed and put under the pyramid. And it's her grandpa, her grandma, and one aunt. And uh, Lillian died about 10 days before the dedication of the uh, pyramid. Now, also, she was very much fascinated by fire trucks and fire department and stuff. And so in her trust, when she died, she left a, a, a huge sum of money to the San Francisco Fire Department. And if you look at the skyline when they do a panorama shot of the San Francisco, you'll see a big high-rise building, which is the Fire Department's office building, and it has a lighted pyramid on top of it. So that's the connection with West Coast and the pyramid here in Murphy, the East Coast. Okay, we are interested in uh, documenting the beginning and the history of this uh, lo our local area. And uh, one of the things that is very prevalent, of course, is uh, the beginning and establishment of it. We have already viewed where the first Indian village in this area was. It was at the confines of the river. Now, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, uh, settlers begin to, after the Revolutionary War, begin to move into this area. And one was Archibald Hunter in the 1800s that was an entrepreneur and he established the trading post, which is down at the confines of the river, about two tenths to two or three tenths mile from here. And he had a ferry across the river and, uh, and he traded with the Indians. Now also, uh, 
when the soldiers moved in for the removal in the 1830s, he traded with the soldiers. Now, uh, he, after trading with the soldiers and stuff and the removal, he had to send his son to Fort Chase in Tennessee to collect the money that they owed his trading post. Now, he had two daughters, and uh, the daughters uh, were grown, and uh, one of them married a major Hitchcock that was here for the Indian removal. Okay, they stayed around for a while and, and acquired property as Hunter owned a lot of property. And uh, the, uh, that's why the property up where the Tout Mines is is called Hitchcock property or Hitchcock Mines. Then he decided that he wanted to go in the late 1840s to the Southwest and, and as a military officer and fight with the Mexicans that they were trying to win the freedom of the territory up there. Now, uh, he grew, they, later on, after the Mexican War, they migrated and moved to San Francisco. Now, they had a daughter by the name of Lillian, and she grew up and married a Cohen, which is a very wealthy, famous family in San Francisco. Because in the park out there, there is a tower, the Cohen Tower. And, uh, and then later, uh, during her trust, when she was setting that up, she left money for the fire department because she was fond of the, those first responders and fire department uh, to build their high-rise office building. And then if you look at the skyline of San Francisco, you'll see a lighted pyramid-type structure on top of it. Now, she traveled a lot because, like I said, she was very wealthy and had a lot of money. And so in one of her travels to Egypt, she was fascinated by the pyramids. And so when she came back to the country, she gave $10,000 to construct this pyramid in honor of her grandfather, her grandmother, and one aunt, which was the other sister of Archibald Hunter. Now this little area right here that is fenced in with a concrete wall, on the records, on the Register of Deeds and stuff is known as the Coet Cemetery, if you look it up. And so, but she had this erected. Now, the, uh, the, the family was in turn interred down here by the road. And so when you turn off at the fire department, you'll have a section up to this third street of, that's called Hunter Street, before you go into Cherokee Street or, or the third street. And that's where they were buried, and so they were removed from there and put under the pyramid. Now, uh, the only thing that, that is negative about this, she visited when they was building this stuff, and, and her picture is, was captured with some of the freed slaves, because Hunter had owned slaves, and uh, out here at Cool Springs. And Cool Springs is on this road, and that water has never went dry. You know, people have gathered water for uh, decades there. And so, but she, before this was erected, while it was being erected and stuff, before it was dedicated, she died 10 days before it was uh, done. It was finished in the 1930s, 1939, I think, to be exact, and stuff. But it, it's, a, it's a memorial, it's the burial of her grandfather, grandmother, and one aunt and stuff, you know, in, in that. And then, uh, this is, is a, we say when we're telling about the history of this area, you know, we have a connection here on the East Coast with the connection in San Francisco, you know, with the court tower and then with the fire department with the lighted pyramid on it. And uh, the, uh, you can tell it's constructed. If you look at the bottom of it, you can tell it is constructed of marble the same marble that was used on our courthouse, you know, and so so locally quarried marble. Uh, now, in the removal, this would be prior to the pyramid being here or their graves, but during the removal, this site here was part of Fort Butler. And the best we can determine, which is 
you know, scholarly accurate, I think, is this was where the medical corps was. You know, the officers and stuff that took care of them are supposed to take care of them and, uh, and the, the removal. And uh, it goes back here. Now, Fort Butler site itself covered 400 acres, plus or minus. Okay, now, so this whole ridge out through here to the, uh, the site up on Fort Butler Street would have been occupied by different companies of the military and, uh, and stuff during the removal. Now, I think the stockade was built at the other end, there above Wilson Building Supply or on Butler, Fort Butler Street. Uh, because just a few of the Indians was renegades or, or, or trouble arousers. A lot of them came in peaceably. And, uh, you know, because they had resigned to their fate. And uh, because one of the things that I say, the resignation to the fate, and when you see pictures or artist renditions of the Trail of Tears, you've got to keep in mind that we were taking them from their homeland. And not only that, but we were removing them to the West. And in the Indian mind construct, the West was the place of death because that's where the sun goes out. And so, that, so they were very passive, they were very resigned to the fact. But a lot of the Indian villages that was established around here, uh, the river wouldn't be this big then, but it, Hiawassee would be bigger than Valley River, but they were allowed just to camp down by the river. And so the military looked over them and watched them, you know. And then of course, some of them were put into uh, the stockade. But one of the things too is, you know, being congregated like that and then interaction with the military and the white people. The Indians acquired a lot of diseases that they wasn't immune to even at that time. And so they were uh, several lost uh, deaths. Now, from this location here, and we'll talk more about that up at the other side, you know, is, is where the Indians were removed on the, house, I mean, on the Unicoi Turnpike, which was the only road in here and stuff. And it came down from Hazel and then down and through Unica into Tennessee. Okay, now, uh, so this pyramid here, it's on private property, but like I said, this is known, this little area here that's fenced in, is known as the Coit Cemetery uh, on the records of the fire department and on the register of deeds. Okay, we're standing here and showing the uh, western end of the Fort Butler site. As we looked at the pyramid a minute ago, the, uh, that would be the medical core. But now keep in mind that Fort Butler itself encompassed 400 acres of property. And so this is the western end, and this is probably most likely where the stockades were that it would be to kept, keep the renegade Indians. Now uh, this site, uh, like I said, was for the, uh, most likely for the renegade Indians. It had officers, quarters, mess hall, and bunks. Uh, situated around just off the roll of the hill. And uh, one of the interesting things that I noted is when I was in high school, uh, I was always interested in history. And Charlie Johnson, uh, who was uh, the town manager for a long time, uh, I would talk with him a lot, and he lived here in Murphy and stuff. And he told me that up here on the Fort Butler site, there was a brick walkway from that made with homemade bricks that extended from the officers' quarters to the mess hall. Now, of course, when they cleaned this up and, 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 uh, and was uh, put in this little memorial, I don't know what they did, but the boy that lived just over the little draw there, uh, uh, Stiles, he, t he said that when he was little and playing, that down next to the little creek that runs out was a uh, sizable cache of those homemade brick. So they have evidently threw them away. So with Charlie Johnson telling me that, this is a pretty good indication 
that this was the western end of the uh, Fort Butler. Now, at Fort Butler here, uh, as I already mentioned, we had some of the Indians that was very passive, very peaceable, and they would, the soldiers would watch over them, but they would be allowed to camp down by the river as a group. Uh, others they put in the stockades. Now, they were kept here through the summer. Uh, they started collecting them in early summer and then up until October. And so in confines like that, a lot of the Indians uh, died of exposure and communicable diseases that they didn't have immunity to. Uh, so the Indian leaders went to the military leaders and asked to organize their own march to get out of here. And so, so they allowed them to under the soldiers' gardens, and they marched them down, the, as mentioned, the Unicoi Turnpike. Now, here in this Fort Butler, we collected 3,200 Indians from Western North Carolina. And they marched them out in waves of, uh, the first, they went three waves. They went 900 at the first group, 1,100 the second group, and 1,200 the third group, and down the Unicoi Turnpike into Unica and then into Tennessee. Uh, the original plan for the removal of the Indians was to load them on river boats in Chattanooga. That's why you have Ross's Landing, because John Ross was the principal chief of the Indian Cherokees, and so, but, it had been a very dry summer, and so the, the, little, the Tennessee River didn't have a lot of water in it, so the paddle wheels couldn't go. I think they might have taken one, maybe two uh, boat loads up the Tennessee River into the Ohio. But the Indians didn't like that. They didn't like riding on a boat anyway. And so, so uh, when they did, finally got to organize their march, it was in October and then the winter was setting in. Not only had we had the dry summer here in the southeast, but we had the wet, cold this winter. And so, and, uh, and so on the Trail of Tears, from uh, eastern band of the Cherokees, there was approximately, plus or minus a few, 16,000 Cherokees rounded up. And of those groups, about 4,500 died on the Trail of Tears and is buried along the way. Uh, one interesting little side note is John Ross's wife went with him. And but two or three days out of Oklahoma, uh, she ran across a little Indian maiden that had just had a baby and only had a little blanket to keep it warm in. And so she gave the Indian maiden her coat to wrap the baby in. And so in, in a couple of days, she died of exposure and is buried along the Trail of Tears. Now, some of the Indians escaped the Trail of Tears and m made their way back after they got to Oklahoma. Some of them made their way back. Chief Juna Luska, that we know that buried over in Robbinsville, he came back, walked all the way back from Oklahoma in the 1850s. And so at Robbinsville, they, they, the state granted him 160 acres, which is the site of Robbinsville now. And so he is buried over there. But this is uh, the, the site here. Now there's a couple of little side notes here. One of the things is, you know, Indians died of diseases, communal diseases and exposure. Now the military and officials was not going to take them back to their homestead or to their village side and bury. So the question is, what did they do with the bodies? Most likely they buried them in a mass grave, the ones that died. And uh, for that reason, uh, Wilson Builder Supply is just off th this bank here. You can hear the equipment down there now. And uh, those ladies that work in the store there, they swear that Wilson Builder Supply is haunted because they say things will fall off the shelf, the doors are open, they'll hear people walking in the 
upstairs part and stuff. And, uh, and so I told them, I said, well, you know, that's probably just across that road there is the mass grave for the Indian. And so, you know, if you believe in ghosts or, or a place being haunted, that would be ideal for it. Now, uh, like I said, this, this park was commemorated here uh, by the Civitan Club of Murphy and stuff, you know. And uh, if I may, I'll tell one other little interesting story. A private Burnett, Barnett, who was with a company, B, I think, that the, the military had several companies here. And so uh, the first wave, the 900, uh, he sent, they went to Oklahoma and the, his company accompanied, accompanied them. Now, here's the thing. Uh, the Cherokees, by this time, had become very Christianized. Uh, they, they were some difficulty at first because the, the, the missionaries came in and said, do this, do, do that. And so the Cherokees didn't buy into it. But when they began to work with the Cherokee culture uh, to explain to them you know, who the Great Spirit was and the creation of Mother Earth and Father Son, uh, they began to buy into it, and so the Christian became, they became very Christianized and converted to Christianity very fast. Now, on the march, uh, they sung a song, Jesus, you have been so good to me, what can I do for you, the whole time. And Barnett, the private Barnett, wrote a letter back, and I, in my file, I have a copy of the letter somewhere, and he said that because of the way they had treated the Cherokees, drug them out of their home, and they were marching in her horrendous conditions. That, and they still gave praise to Jesus Christ and sung to them. That every soldier in his company was, became Christians, was converted to Christianity. You know, so I thought that was a good testimony of the Christians, and that's uh, the, the Indians. And that's probably why, you know, they was not more war than they are because they had embraced the civilization process and uh, converted to Christianity. And uh, so uh, this fort here, Fort Butler, the reason it is so large and encompassing is because, and where the Trail of Tears is noted to start, because we had a stockade in Robbinsville, which was Fort Montgomery. We had a stockade in Andrews, which was Fort Delaney, or Valleytown. We had a stockade in Andrews, I mean in uh, Hayesville, which was Fort Hembry. And then there's one in Ninehala, Fort uh, uh, Lindsay. And then there was one at Acorn. And so what they did, they collected the, the, the natives in that area, the Native Americans, and brought them to Fort Butler. This was the collection station. This is where the Trail of Tears was supposed to start, and that's why we're the interpretation center for that. Now, on that, uh, uh, too, you know, it's no coincidence that this is Butler Street, and you it runs into Cherokee Street, you know, there. And so, to commemorate all of, all of the, uh, the removal. Now, keep in mind, and I always like to tell this, on the Trail of Tears, we do not celebrate the Trail of Tears because it was such a dark period of our history as far as genocide and, and, uh, and removal of the Indian. But like 9-11, we commemorate it, we remember it, so we will not make another mistake like that and stuff. So it's not a celebration when we talk about the Trail of Tears, it's a uh, we just uh, commemorate it so that people will be aware of it and stuff and, and what the Indians, Native Americans, went through. Okay, we are at the uh, Hawshaw Chapel. This was the first church building that was built in Murphy. Now, uh, a little bit about the history of Murphy. We, since we have talked about Archibald Hunter, we have seen the Indian village site and uh, Fort Butler. Uh, after the Indian removal 
1838, the name was changed. This used to be known as Huntington, after Archibald Hunter, the community was. And then a senator in Raleigh, an educational promotional center, uh, introduced a bill to incorporate Huntington as the county seat of Cherokee County. And so when doing so, it was uh, given the name Murphy after him. M-U-R-P-H-E-Y was his name. Somewhere between Raleigh and recording it here, the E got lost. When they did this, when they changed it, they sold Murphy off in six acre lots. Now a plantation owner by the name of Joshua Hawshaw bought six acres here to establish this church and cemetery. And, uh, and so the oldest grave here is, they started burying people here in the 1840s. Now the, the chapel here, as you notice, is made from homemade brick. Now, uh, slave brick, it's like the brick that is out at the Hawshaw Plantation. Because the cornerstone and this was laid in the 1850s, but it was not finished, the chapel wasn't until close to after the Civil War. Then they gave the church, the chapel, to the Methodist denomination. And so there's a, about three of the different graves I would like to point out here. One of the things, too, that as archaeologists or historians that you look at, when you go into a, a cemetery of this such, you look at the monuments and do a seriation study, you know, through time uh, frame. And if, one of the things that the cemetery monuments will tell you is the prominent families that lived in the community. You know, here the Maronis, the Coopers, the Fanes, the Mercers. You know, all of those were very prominent families in establishing Murphy here. And uh, another thing that you look at is the, uh, through time, the difference in the monuments. And it indicates the economic structure, social economic structure of a community. The ones that are more elaborate cost more. And so families that were prevalent and had money, they could afford those. And then you get down to the simpler ones, you know, the thin ones, and then the thicker ones, you know, just as economics and stuff, you know. And so this tells you about them in the study. And if you do a yearly, uh, like a decade long study, you can see how, how the changes have occurred in social economic strata. Now there's, uh, in looking at the cemetery specifically, there's three stories that, that I wanted to point out that the monuments uh, deal with and stuff. And so, you know, there, everyone would have a story if you knew it and could tell it and stuff with the family names and stuff. But this one here in particular was George Maney. He was a 32, almost 33 year old from Graham County. And uh, he got into some kind of squabble with a very prominent businessman in Graham County. And he killed him. And so they arrested George and uh, brought him to, uh, and was putting him in jail, but they were afraid to put him in, in Graham County because they said the people would break him out and lynch him and stuff because this fellow that he had killed was so well liked. And so they brought him to Cherokee County and put him in jail. Well, the lynch mob from Robbinsville uh, came to Murphy jail, broke him out, and took, took him on the, down by the, the bridge, the steel bridge that goes to Grape Creek, and hung him. No. And so, so bringing him to Cherokee County didn't help. Those people were too determined in Graham County. And so this is uh, from, a, from a lynch mob one of the prominent families that it was in this area that helped establish Murphy to be what it is today, of course, is the Fanes. Now, the Fanes is the ones that built the uh, wholesale building down here, uh, Hackney, where the Hackney Wholesale is. And they lived in a, a very prominent house over in East Murphy. Now, uh, 
to give you an indication of what Murphy was like in the area, I, I closely associate that with a top Tom Sawyer Huck Finn type thing. And if you'll notice on this grave of two children's grave, because it was very common practice to put lambs on children's grave. Since then, vandals have broken the top of the lambs off. But they, they both died in 1914. And the epitaph down there is beneath this grave is the heroes of a watery grave. Now, uh, what, what the story is, they was a nine and 12 year old siblings. And of course in the area being Tom Sawyer Huck Finn, they swam in the rivers, you know, in the summertime and stuff. And so this was in May and uh, the nine year old boy went in, jumped in swimming and stuff, and got into trouble and was drowning. And then the 12-year-old jumped in the river to save him. And you know, so many times without experience and stuff, they clung to each other and both of them drowned. And so that's why we call it Heroes of a Watery Grave. Okay, each of the graves that are here, has already been mentioned, has a good, unique historical story, I'm sure, about it. And stuff, but this, the, some of them that we pointed out is more talked about, more prevalent. And this is probably the most prevalent story that is talked about and sought out here. Now, uh, Abram Enloe. Now, I have done extensive research on this, and I fully believe what I'm going to tell you. And other scholars, I've read though their research and stuff, and there a lot of scholars are fully convinced that this story is accurate. Now, Abram Enloe was a very wealthy farmer in Polk County in North Carolina, out of past Hendersonville. And he went down to Rutherford County and took a lady for his wife and brought her back to Polk County. Now, he was very prevalent, very wealthy, so they had a full-time housekeeper, and her name was Nancy Hanks. Now, uh, his wife, did not particularly like the, living in Polk County. And so she would go back for extended visits down to her family and stuff, you know, and going and coming would take some time. And so on one of her extended trips, <clears throat> the housekeeper, Nancy Hanks, something happened, she became pregnant. Now, Abram Enloe did not want his wife to find out about it, one. Two, or she found out about it and, and was upset, but he had to get rid of Nancy Hanks. And so he hired a local uh, handyman by the name of Tom Lincoln to take Nancy Hanks away. And so he took Nancy Hanks away and she went to Kentucky and established a homestead. The baby were born, was born. Now, Abram Enloe wanted to have uh, a relationship and contact with his son. So he went to the same community and built a general store. Now, in doing so, of course, this upset Tom Lincoln, and so he picked the boy up and Nancy Hanks, and they moved to Illinois. And uh, we know that's where Abraham Lincoln grew up and was senator and then became president from Illinois. Now, Abraham Enloe, uh, moved his farm to the Meadows area, which is over as you go up to the Smoky Mountains and established a farm there. Then in the 1840s, which this, this, child, this cemetery had just been established and stuff, but Abraham Enloe was going to Tennessee because they had opened it up to homesteading and, and invited people to come to get more population and they had cut Tennessee off of North Carolina because North Carolina used to go all the way to the Mississippi River. Now, he was coming through Murphy and stuff, and so when he got here, he got the flu and uh, was doctored, but he ended up dying. And so that is why his grave is here. And so he is the biological father of Abraham Lincoln. Now we have pictures of Abraham Lincoln compared to Wesley Enloe, which is the legitimate son of Abraham Enloe. And they're almost identical. You know, you can't tell them apart. They're both tall and lanky 
and all of the in-laws had a quick wit about them, a good sense of humor, you know, and the, while at the Tom Lincoln's family the ancestry, they were short, fat, dumpy, and real dry, didn't have no sense of humor. Well, that's what we know of Abraham Lincoln. He had a quick wit, you know, and tall and lanky. And so compared to Wesley, Wesley Enlow, very prevalent likeness. Okay, this structure here is uh, the gentleman that is, uh, that is responsible for the Hawshaw Chapel in the cemetery here was Joshua Hawshaw. Now, he and two other brothers came into this area and established uh, the farms. Uh, Joshua Hawshaw had his plantation up at uh, Bricetown, up above the Bricetown Community Center. The other Joshua Hawshaw's plantation, I mean Edgar Hawshaw plantation site is out on the river going up towards Tri-County. And uh, But Joshua Hawshaw is the one that purchased the six acre of land and established the church and the cemetery. And he, his wife, and one son is buried here. Now they have this wall constructed around it which must have been from where they came from uh, a particular aspect which was from a uh, I forget which country it was, but out at the Hawshaw Cemetery on the river going towards Tri-County, there is a larger cemetery with the Hawshaw family buried in it, and it's got a, a wall around it just like this. And uh, one of the interesting facts uh, about this, that they were buried here, but the Edgar Hawshaw's family buried in the one out at the Hawshaw plantation site on the river, uh, they have two grave markers outside, and it's their favorite slaves. One was the housekeeper and one was the butler. And so, but they couldn't bury them inside with the white people. So they buried them right outside next to the wall. You know, and that's a little cultural thing. Okay, this is the Hawshaw Cemetery at the plantation site on the, the river going up towards Tri-County. And uh, this is one of the two brothers. The other cemetery, and we saw the, the burials of, of Joshua Hawshaw in the Hawshaw Chapel. And this is Abram Hawshaw that established this cemetery. Now there are several, or, or at least two or three generations buried here. Abram Hawshaw was uh, born in 1785 and didn't die to 1857, so he was prior to the Civil War. And then Edgar Hawshaw, his descendants and, and stuff came on down. Now, so this is the a more prevalent cemetery than the one that was at the chapel of the Joshua Hawshaw's family. And uh, it was again common to enclose the cemetery in the rock wall of this such. And uh, interesting fact here is uh, you couldn't bury black people with white people at that time frame. And so just outside the wall here are two markers, which was their two favorite slaves. One was their cook and one was their butler and stuff. And so they, when they died, they buried them as close to they could without getting them in the cemetery with the whites.